chapter 3, verses 5 to 8. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in the human language. But no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if, if through my life God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some may slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. Please remain Let's just pray that I can devote this time to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, God, thank you for the reading of your word. I pray that um, each and every soul here would apply and interpret your word the way you intended for it to be done. That we would understand um, that we are not to be impressed by what we read. Uh, by who we read about. And I ask that you would uh, bless this time that we have as we devote it to, uh, to the application, study, interpretation of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. I know there's a lot of sitting and standing there. So you know, uh, uh, as, a, uh, as a parent now for the last six years, I have learned a lot of things. Uh, I will learn a lot of things, many more things. Uh, from the mid from years here on out. And I've noticed one thing, uh, especially when it comes to children, and probably for those teenagers, that you learn to pick your battles. Uh, you learn to pick your battles. Um, there are times where you respond um, with reason and logic. There are times you stick to your guns and refrain from any kind of discourse and just say, because that's the way it is. If we're in the store, my children see something they don't they want, right? See something they like, and what do they want? What do they ask? Can I have this? And so clearly, no. Right? So no, you may not. And so then what happens? No, but I really want it. I know. I know. Lifestyle. <laughs> no. Preparing you. No. No, I, I really, I, I really want it. I understand. No. But my friend has one. Still, no. No, you don't understand. I, I need this. I need this. Now, at that point in time, I could stop use logic, say, okay, let's talk about necessity. Okay. Let's talk about uh, shelter and warmth and, and, and clothing and food. Those are necessities. Um, Captain America there is not a necessity. Right? I could go that route, or I could just say, no, put it down, or else. Okay? So you could go either one too often. Sometimes it's okay to explain, well, you know what, That's I know you want it, and I know it's important to you, um, but it's not really a necessity, and maybe you'll get one for Christmas or your birthday. That's always our go-to line. <laughs> <laughs> maybe somebody will get it to you for, for, for Christmas or your birthday. Oh, okay. Right? And, or sometimes the answer is just no. I, I don't have time right now. I'm not going to get into it. The answer is no. I'm sorry you feel that way. The answer is no. Put it back. See? When it comes to irrationality, when it comes to illogical argument reasoning, <coughs> Solomon tells us we have two options. Uh, and, and I think I've quoted this in the past. Uh, Proverbs 26, uh, 5 and 6 uh, says this. Proverbs 20, uh, 26, 4. I'm actually going to read it. I'm going to get the quotes all wrong. Go to Proverbs 26. Solomon writes this. Sorry, 20, uh, 26, 4. He says this. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Okay, so when, when you have somebody that brings the illogical reasoning or, or, or just uh, 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 reason that doesn't make any sense, just don't even respond because as soon as you respond to him or her, now all of a sudden um, you, you, uh, you bring them up to your level or you get down to their level and now you validate their reasoning, which it really doesn't need to be validated at all. 
So just don't even do it. But, so you say, okay, now I'll just ignore them now. But then in verse 5, he says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. That's okay. Don't answer the fool, lest you be like him yourself. Answer the fool so that he's not wise in his own eyes. Well, which is it? What's well, both? Right? There are times you, you reason with a child or you reason with a fool. And there are times you ignore them. You ignore the, the illogical reason. When I was a little a few several years ago, I was in Chicago, I was coming out of the store, uh, and a guy um, kind of popped up out of nowhere, they always pop out of nowhere, and said, I'm Superman. <laughs> and so, okay, all right, that's a new one. Uh, and so I had two choices, okay? Either want sit down, let me, let's sit down. Okay. Where's your cape? <laughs> if you were really Superman, you'd have a cape, right? If you were really Superman, you'd have tights on, right? And I don't know where else I have your tights. But so I really don't think you're Superman, right? Superman comes from Krypton. Where are you born? So I could get into that, or I could just go the route, okay, thank you, boy. I went that route, okay. And thinking back on that, I could have had a lot of fun there. But <laughs> so I, I just said, okay, there you go. Paul was in a very similar situation. In Romans, throughout Romans, um, he, he um, presents these fictional discourses between he and his critics. And he was anticipating what his critics would say, what his opponents would say, uh, as he uh, delivered the, the book of Romans to the Christians who were there in Rome. He, he knew his critics, and so uh, uh, he, he understood their folly. And so he had either one of two choices, either respond to them according to their foolishness, Proving that they are not as wise as they think they are, or not uh, uh, bringing himself to that level. And so, in fact, in Romans, he does both. In uh, Romans 6, 1, he does respond to them. But here in Romans 3, 5 to 8, he actually ignores their reasoning, doesn't get sucked into it, uh, and proceeds to uh, 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 chide them and ultimately deliver uh, news of uh, condemnation to them. So turn with me again. I'm going to read it again. Romans 3, 5 to 8. Paul writes this, But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means, for then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come, as some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just? I was speaking to another individual in a young guy in my office. I had no idea how he got there. Um, I, don't, I don't remember his name. I don't know who he was. I don't know. Uh, and I remember talking to him about just sharing the gospel with him. And he was, he was hurting. And we talked about, you know, his beliefs. And his beliefs were, he said, you know, I believe and that we all live in a matrix, right? That nothing's really real, that there is no reality, um, that we can't prove uh, anything that happened in the past, and we're all just in a state of, of, of sleep, basically. And uh, I've watching way too many movies. Uh, <laughs> and so I thought, I, I wasn't really in the mood, so I just thought, you know what? Um, let's go back to Jesus. I might even go there. I might even go there. I mean, let's go back to who Jesus is. And so, um, really just kind of ignoring the line of reasoning that he was going about. And so that's kind of what Paul does here. Remember, this is a fictional discourse that he is anticipating his critics on using. He knows the mind of his opponents. He knows the mind of man. He knows how the cogs and the wheels function. He knows exactly where they're going. Because chances are they've gone there in the past and he knows that they were going to go there anyways. So you figure, I'm going to beat them to the punch. I know exactly what they're going to do. I know exactly what they're going to say because I've heard it all before. And this is the way it goes. And so he, he, he uh, proceeds to explain what their response is going to be uh, concerning everything that he just wrote in chapters 1 and 2. Right? About the law being uh, uh, no longer needed at being uh, Christ alone and faith alone in Christ. And so this is how the argumentation goes from his critics. He said this. So basically they're saying this. If, if my unrighteousness 
forces the hand of God to act in a just way, righteousness results. If my lies are exposed by the truth of God, then all of a sudden the truth of God has now been uh, exposed and, and, and God's glory is but then. He says, what about the evil that we do? So if our evil all of a sudden is, is opposed by God's goodness, then God's glory is met. So then, then Paul, why are you calling us a sinner? Right? That makes sense. So they, otherwise, if they're after the glory of God, see, we really want the glory of God. And so if, if, if we're acting unrighteously, righteousness will result because God will, will, just, will, will bring justice. If we're lying, God's truth will be exposed. If we are evil, then God's goodness will be exposed. So then, why are you calling us a sinner if what we're doing actually results in the glory of God in the first place? So why are you condemning us? The same type of argument could be like this. Imagine somebody, a, 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 a criminal, is being is tried in court. The criminal stands up and says, I'd like to say something in my defense. Let's look at the facts. <clears throat> my, uh, my misdeeds have brought on justice. You've caught me. Justice has prevailed. Right? Jurisprudence has happened. My lies have forced the truth to come out of the prosecution. And, and my evil deeds, okay, my theft, has caused the insurance company to reimburse and to, uh, 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 and to give back to the defendant all and more than they lost. So, another, so they're actually one. So why are you condemning me? In fact, you should be thanking me for what I've done. What would happen? What would happen? Sandra, would that fly in court? That would not fly in court. You know, what would the judge say? Are you nuts? Are you crazy? You egotistical man. I'm assuming man, because a man would come up with something like that. <laughs> what we have here both in the court and, and among Paul's critics and opponents. What we have is basically, uh, it was John Piper that really summed up this, this concept, uh, it is uh, sophism at its best or worst. It's sophism. Sophism, the sophists, the Greek sophists or sophists, were, they, were the uh, rhetoricians, they were the, the orators, they were the teachers, the philosophers. They would wax eloquently on a certain topic and, and, and just uh, amaze people by the way they use language. And what Aristotle called it, uh, 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 wisdom in appearance only. It appeared to be wise, but yet it's really just foolishness when you really boil it down to its most basic denominator. It's just foolishness. It doesn't oppose truth. It doesn't take truth and oppose it uh, with a lie. What it does is it twists things. That's what sophism does. It's, it twists things. It distorts things. Exactly what his opponents were doing here. If you remember back in uh, 1998, this is kind of the first thing I thought of. Former President Bill Clinton, after he was uh, brought up um, for the grand jury on uh, kind of an inappropriate relationship with one of his interns, Monica Lewinsky. And um, it was there that he pulled a, a sophist argument. He, he started to redefine what the word is, is. This is what he said. I, kinda, I, I was thinking through this. I'm like, did it actually happen the way uh, I remember it happening? And it did. Uh, this is what he said. This is the, the sophism. When asked by the grand jury about the details of this sordid affair, he says it depends on what the meaning of the word is is. If, the, if, he, if, if is means is and never has been, then that is not, that's one thing. If it means there is none, that was a completely true statement. Now, if someone had asked me on that day, are you having any kind of sexual relations with Ms. Lewinsky? That is, asked me a question in the present tense, I would have said no. And it would have been completely true. So all of a sudden, the, you know, the media and the grand jury started catching up. He's trying to redefine what the term is, is. And that's sophism. That's sophism at its best. Trying to, to twist and disturb words, playing games, word games. It doesn't deny truth, 
It doesn't even answer truth. It tries to twist truth in their favor. That's what the sophists did. That's what many people do today. Christians do the same thing. See, that's a very demonic uh, way of, of, of uh, using truth, isn't it? Satan will never oppose truth with an outright lie. What does he do? He twists it. He distorts it. He exercises sophism, doesn't he? So when Adam and Eve were in the garden and, and he came to Eve and said, Eve, uh, take of this fruit. She said, no, no, God told us not to eat of this fruit. He said, did God really say that? Let's talk about that term, eat. Did he really mean eat as in take a bite and chew it? Did he mean eat in the metaphorical sense? I don't know now. I think he probably meant in the metaphorical sense. Probably in fact, he actually wanted you to eat it. That's what he really meant when he said not to eat it. Oh, okay. That's sophism. That's, what, that's a, a satanic use of, of, of words. Play games. That's exactly what we see here. In chapter 3, verses 5 to 8. Playing games. The first game they were playing was a, 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 a trying to convince Paul and trying to convince everybody else that they're really after the glory of God. That's what they wanted. Paul, we really want the glory of God. And so if it means us acting unrighteously, that, that the glory of God would, be, would result, then okay. If it means us lying, if it means us acting evil, then ultimately God will be glorified in the end, then that's the price I'm willing to make because I'm really after the glory of God. They were not after the glory of God. It's a sophist argument. There are times, some more than others, where we claim to be after the glory of God. I just really want the glory of God in my life, but your actions don't, uh, don't agree with that. What you say and what you do are totally different. Stop playing games. And see, the sophist plays games. The sophist doesn't outright rebel and say, I don't want to obey God. The sophist says, no, I really want to obey God. In fact, I am obeying God, and, and this is why I chose to do this, and this is why I'm doing this or engaging in this. You play games. Well, what do you mean by sin? See, the sophist plays in the gray areas of Scripture. Don't they? You've met these people. I've met these people. We've been these people. Is it really sin? You know, let's, let's read the context. Did God really say that? Play games. Games. You know, I, I, listen, I just really want the glory of God to... to uh, I just want to see God be glorified in my life. That's all. Play games. See, the sophists uh, proclaim, claim, rather, to seek the glory of God, but we know they don't seek the glory of God. They seek the glory of self and what is convenient for self. They also believe that the, the end justifies the means. You know, that's what they're doing. They say, well, you know, if the end is the glory of God and the means happen to be unrighteousness, then so be it. If the means is the glory of God, then, 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 uh, then if I lie, so be it. If the means, uh, if the end rather is the goodness of God, then may I act in an evil way so it brings that about. In other words, if the end would justify the means, how often do we act in such a way where the ends constantly justify the means? <coughs> I think Jared, a couple of weeks ago when he was preaching, uh, kind of professed the same thing. And I want to be like them in order to reach them. Right? How are they going to know about Jesus if I'm not hanging out with them? Even in that place, we're doing that activity. I have to be like them, right, if I want to bring them to Christ. It's a baby, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't expect a whole lot. So, uh, you know what, we should probably live together, right? I mean, we don't want to marry each other, commit ourselves and get divorced. That's not glorifying to God, so we should probably just live together and make sure everything's okay. And then, if we like each other, get married. Because God honors marriage, and we don't want to rush into anything. I don't want to lie to my boss. See, if I tell my boss the truth, I'll probably lose my job. Now, if I lose my job, 
I'm no longer able to, to uh, make ends meet for myself and for my family. So, I don't know, I can't lose my job. That, God would not be glorified in that way, would he? So I better not, uh, I, I, I better not tarnish the glory of God, so I should probably lie to my boss so that I keep my job so that I'm not a bad husband uh, and I can even provide for my family, provide for my kids. Sophism. Sophism plays word games. They believe the, the ends justify the means. Why do we do that? Why does the sophist do that? Well, first off, the sophist does that because they do what they want to do. They'll justify doing whatever it is they do because they want to do it. They do it because they want to. That's what makes them feel good. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. Second reason they do it is that's our nature, really. That is the, the nature of the sophist, isn't it? See, the nature of the sophist is one to wriggle off the hook of the convicting element of the Holy Spirit. It's our nature. Heaven forbid we be convicted. I'm going to dodge that the best. I came here and tried to put a, a worm on a hook. It's wriggling all over the place. You would too. <coughs> Been impaled by a hook. The last thing what I would do is it'd be impaled by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You like how I did that? <laughs> You're the worm, by the way. <laughs> Hook being convicted of the Holy Spirit. We do that because our forefathers did that. That's what Adam did. That's what Cain did. Adam did. Did you eat of that fruit? My wife gave me something. <laughs> Cain, where's your brother? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? He knew where Cain was. God knew where Cain was. It's God. You're lying to God. God knew you were going to whack your brother before you even thought about it. What's he doing? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what sin. What I don't. I don't know. I, mean, well, I didn't know I was supposed to be responsible for him. I, uh, what's our nature? Our nature is to wiggle. Our nature is to avoid that. Heaven forbid we be pressed by the convicting element of God that we would be forced into in order to admit what sin is. Another reason we do that is we don't believe ultimately God cares about the means. God doesn't care clearly about the behavior of our life. Just as long as God knows that I love Him, just as long as I know that my salvation brings me into the eternal presence of God, then what difference does my behavior make? Who cares? God wants me to be a good worker. Who cares about how I actually do that as long as I, I can say at the end of the day I, I, I succeeded? God wants me to be a good husband. Who cares how I go about doing that as long as I can say I was a good husband? See, God cares about the means. God doesn't just care about, I, I don't want you to just end here. I want you to end up here. But this is the way I want you to travel. This is the way I want you to get there. If you don't believe me, think back to Numbers 20. What happened when Mo God told Moses to strike the, to speak to the rock? Well, the first time the Israelites were thirsty, they said Moses were thirsty. Moses said to God, God, what am I supposed to do? God says, strike the rock and the water will come out. He says, okay. So he struck the rock and water came out. Everybody's going and on. Oh, Moses, that was awesome. And then they start doing it again. We're thirsty. God says, speak to the rock, Moses. Moses says, okay, so he goes to the rock, and instead of speaking to it, he strikes it. God is a merciful God, and water came out. But he wasn't done with Moses. He says, Moses, because you struck that rock and didn't speak to it like I told you to, you will not enter the land of Canaan. Why? Because God cared about the means. He cared about how Moses was going to provide for the people with water. God cares about that. God cares about the means. God cares about how we do what we do, our behavior. God cares about the unrighteousness of the sawdust. He cares. He wants that to turn into the righteousness. He cares about the lying. He wants that to turn into truth. He cares about the evil. He wants that to turn that into goodness. And may our goodness bring about the goodness of God. May our righteousness bring about the righteousness of God. And may our truth bring about the truth of God. 
It's trusting in God and in God's process. It's acting in such a way where He is glorified by the means, knowing that He too will be glorified by the ends, and our good will be met when He is glorified. It's at that point, Paul in this fictional dialogue, he says, enough. If you kind of can picture it, uh, the Pharisees did this all the time with Jesus. Right? They were always trying to choke him out. Always, always, always. Right? They get into this little cackle. Right? Get into this little group. Hey, let's ask him this. Let's see what he says about this. Let's say this is asking this. Let's see what he does with that. And so the same group, the same fictional group that the Pharisees were, uh, Paul uh, responds to, this is enough. Enough. That's what he says in verse 8. This is their condemnation is just. Speaking to them, speaking about them. That's why you're condemned. That's why you're condemned. It's because you play these games. It's because you play these word games, the, 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 uh, you, these, these softest games. See, the, the, the smoke and mirrors are all around now. I love um, uh, uh, illusionists. I think that it's cool to see. Uh, once in a while, I catch one song. An American uh, has got talent. And then we got once in a while a magician on, an illusionist. And I think they're the coolest things. Just try, try to, uh, to, to, how they do what they do. Right? And we know how they do it. We know it's not magic. And we know exactly what's happening. There's many mirrors. There's smoke. There's cover-ups. There's showmanship. And while they're doing and saying one thing, something's happening behind them or they're doing something under the table. We know that, but it still boggles us how they do it. And so this is what the sophist does. There's a lot of showmanship in their life and what they do. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors. But when they all come down, Paul says, that is why your condemnation is just. You have brought on condemnation because you have uh, uh, denied the convicting element of the Holy Spirit. You have failed to honor God as God is to be honored. You have played games. The games are over. The games are done. This is why. If you want to know why me and the other apostles, why we, we uh, proclaim judgment on you and condemnation, that's why you keep playing these games with words. You fail to admit it. You fail to identify what sin is. And you ask the stupid question, what is is? It says, enough. This is why you're condemned. This is why you're being held accountable to God. That's why. Because you're busy playing games with the Word of God. That's why. As I thought through this, I thought the most, most damning sophism that we see in Scripture was done by Pilate. Turn to John. The most damning sophism was done by Pilate. Turn to John 18.37. Page 905 of your uh, chair Bible. John 18.37. John records Jesus speaking to Pilate here. He says, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world, not from the world. And Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate had a huge opportunity here. A huge opportunity. He had the Son of God standing in his presence, and he chooses rather to play games and to go the sophist route. In verse 38, Pilate said to him, What is truth? I came for this reason, to bear truth. And anybody who is of the truth listens to me. And Pilate, he had the Son of God right there. The biggest opportunity in all of human history. He had Jesus Christ standing right before him. He had him. And he chose, he chose rather to play games. To play the softest games. What is truth, Jesus? Really? 
He knew what truth was. He knew, he knew what truth was. He knew truth because he could identify a lie. He knew what was true and what was not true. He knew that with evidence, a, a truth can be found. But he'd rather play the game. He really didn't want to fight, fight. He didn't really want to face the reality of the situation. That was, he was not the big bad man that he thought he was. And that he too needed to repent and kneel before Jesus, who was king. But he chose rather than to submit and obey. He chose to play games, failing to experience the regeneration of Christ. You and I fail to experience the regeneration. The Holy Spirit, where we play word games with the Word of God, and we fail, and we fail to let them pierce our heart. We'd rather wiggle out of the way and do what we want to do, rather than allow the uh, the life changing, convicting Word of God to do a work in our soul, that God might be glorified and our good would be met through His glory. Let's pray, dear Heavenly Father. <clears throat> You know exactly when we are going to play the next word games with your word. You know exactly when we're going to enter into the sophist mindset. We're going to attempt to confuse and disorient other people, and even confuse and disorient ourselves. But we know that you are not confused and disoriented. You see right through the smoke and mirrors. You see right through the showmanship. God, may your Holy Spirit convict us. May we experience the regeneration of your Spirit. May we experience the renewal. May we experience the forgiveness and mercy and redeeming grace as we come before you. I'm laying down these games that we play and being forthright with who we are and what we do. God, may be glorified in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.